Welcome to the Digital Annual Lecture, a global event with the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, who's online with us now, uh, speaking from Sydney, Australia. Ambassador Nick Burns in the United States will be making some reflections and comments on Malcolm's uh, speech when it's done. And with me here, uh, Jonathan Lord Hill, Chairman of Ditchley, um, uh, Catherine Wills and a group in the library, and then a second group in the Great Hall, who you'll see as another uh, um, player in the, the conversation, another participant in the, the conversation. We've gathered a small group here, we're at just over 50. There are many, many more hundreds of people online, and we're just so pleased that you could join us and uh, what I'm sure is going to be a, a great uh, discussion, a great um, speech, having talked a lot to Malcolm about it. Just a couple more things um, in terms of how we're going to run the event. Uh, in a, just a moment, I'll hand over to Jonathan formally to welcome and to introduce Malcolm's speech. Then we'll hear from Malcolm and we'll go into the question and answer session. Uh, I will compare that. Um, my team will help me select questions from the chat. So please think about what you would like to ask. Obviously, we won't be able to get to everyone, but we'll get through as many questions as we can um, and, and work that through. And we'll be switching between questions online and then some questions from people here physically at Ditchley. Uh, the speech itself is, of course, on the record. Uh, the question and answer session is off the record and only for the people on this call and for our general education and reflection. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce and welcome Jonathan to, uh, in turn, hand over to Malcolm. Jonathan. James, thank you uh, very much indeed. And good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Ditchley's annual lecture 2021, where I'm delighted to say we have got real people back at Ditchley again, and the Ditchley buzz is uh, going around, I can <coughs> promise you. We're not in our usual marquee, but here in the uh, library and in next door in the Great Hall. Now, I said good afternoon, but to this year's annual lecturer, who's joining us from Sydney, it's very much good evening. And it is, of course, good morning in North America, where members of American and Canadian Ditchley have got up bright and early to join us. So wherever you're joining us from around the world, you're very welcome. And I know that in a moment, you're going to hear a humdinger of an annual lecture. In fact, I think that this year's annual lecture, how we've organized it, how we're broadcasting it, our choice of lecturer, the international audience that we have invited, they stand as a powerful symbol of what has been, despite everything, a very successful year at Ditchley. So let me start here in the library with the Bridge Project, which James had the great foresight to kick off some three years ago. And to all intents and purposes, the library looks like the rest of the house, a beautifully maintained and restored 18th century room. But behind these panels and the tapestries, we have installed state-of-the-art technology, which enables us to link up with anywhere in the world with connections of broadcast quality and to hold discussions which are properly interactive. And with people traveling less, but having learnt how easy it is to take part in global conversations, Ditchley, as James said, is now one of the best connected places in Europe to bring people together from around the world. And we've obviously benefited greatly from James's vision, but we're also extremely grateful for the generosity of our supporters and donors without whom we couldn't have done it. What it means is that we are now incredibly well set up for the future, holding meetings here, but also able to bring in speakers from around the world. And what a powerful way that is of fulfilling our goal of bringing people together to think new things and make new connections and of realizing Sir David Will's original vision. Now, the second great area of progress over the last year has been in the house itself, where we've been forging ahead 
with a program of restoration and improvement on the second floor. Asbestos has been ripped out and no doubt to the delight of our American friends with their radical notions of cleanliness, bathrooms are being put in. And here again, we've turned lockdown to our advantage. Instead of going to outside contractors, we've done the work in-house, not just to a very high quality, but at a significant saving. James reckons well over a million pounds less than we would have had to have paid. And again, we've been investing for the future, getting ahead, making sure that Ditchley is a fantastic place to come and stay, and putting us in a very good place to increase our commercial income when we're not using the house ourselves. And I know that I speak for everyone here when I say that the house and the grounds are looking absolutely superb. That doesn't happen by accident, but by hard work and the pride that the Ditchley team has in the house. The third theme I wanted to highlight is the very impressive way in which James and his colleagues have adapted our way of working during the pandemic. It would have been easy to see only the, the downside from COVID, the challenge to our model of bringing people together and to have hunkered down. Instead, from the get-go, we approached it the other way round realizing that the world of Zoom and Teams extended our international reach and made it much easier for serving politicians, officials, academics, business leaders to join our discussions and build connections. So on that front too, it's been a year of expansion, of innovation and of progress. So you find us chipper about what we have achieved over the past year, and confident about the year ahead. But we know that we couldn't have made the progress we have without the support and encouragement we've received from so many people. Here at the Mothership, we're very grateful for the backing we've got, moral and financial, from American and Canadian Ditchley. Over the last year, our ties have been growing stronger and deeper, and the support we get uh, has been uh, also getting deeper. Whether that's for our intern program from Canadian Ditchley or for the bridge and the second floor restoration from American Ditchley. So thank you to them and to the growing number of our business and charitable supporters and to the individual donors who have become part of our 1580 fellowship. Thank you as always to Catherine, Catherine Wills, who does so much to make sure that her father's legacy lives on. I'm also very grateful to the Ditchley Council of Management for all the help and encouragement they've given me over the last year. And of course, on behalf of everyone connected with Ditchley, I'd like to thank James and Kerry for the magnificent job that they do, and through them, the whole Ditchley team. Now, I said at the beginning that this year's annual lecture strikes me as a symbol for today's Ditchley. And it would be difficult to be more global in our outlook than to invite a lecturer literally from the other side of the world. And it would have been difficult for him to have come up with a theme for his lecture of greater relevance to us all than the one he has chosen. Rivals without, enemies within, standing up for democracy in the 21st century. Now, I think it's harder to think of anyone better equipped by background, experience, and character to take on that theme than Malcolm Turnbull. If we reflect on the challenges that our democracies face from outside, who better to talk to us than someone who's dealt with China firsthand? If we think about developments in the Indo-Pacific, who better to talk to us than someone who actually helped shape those developments? And if we think about the challenges we might face from within, who better to talk to us than someone who's played such a leading part in one of the most rumbustious democracies in the world? 
And there's, there's something else about Malcolm I spotted that should make him a pinup for Britain's trade minister, Liz Trust. If Malcolm hadn't saved the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership from Donald Trump's attempts to kill it, Britain would not have been able to apply to join the CPTPP last month. So Malcolm, you were not just Prime Minister of Australia, you've turned out to be a key part of global Britain. But even more important than being the Prime Minister of Australia as part of a glittering career that took him from journalism to law, to banking, to politics, to the highest elected position in the land, Malcolm has become a great friend and supporter of Ditchley and is now keen to export the Ditchley model to Australasia. And that is a bit of free trade of which we thoroughly approve. So it gives me particular pleasure, therefore, to invite him to give us this year's lecture, Rivals Without, Enemies Within, Standing Up for Democracy in the 21st Century. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan and, and James. It's uh, very good of you to invite me to speak at such a great distance at Ditchley. And I want to acknowledge also, of course, uh, Dr. Catherine Wills and the remarkable generosity and commitment of her family that have made Ditchley possible. Two days in two places, six months apart. One at the heart of America's democracy, the other at the heart of China's autocracy. On January 6 in Washington DC, a mob stormed and sacked the Capitol. It was an insurrection, egged on by President Trump and intended to stop the Congress certifying the election of Joe Biden. The vice president and the members of the most powerful legislature on earth fled for their lives. As unable to combat the virus as it was to protect its Congress, a battered America had never seemed so exhausted or so divided. On July 1 in Beijing, President Xi Jinping presided over the celebration of 100 years of the Communist Party, China's rulers for 72 of them. Thousands of soldiers and hand-picked cadres marched and cheered. From the very place where Mao Zedong founded modern China in 1949, Xi radiated pride, confidence and power. China was stronger, richer and more united than ever. Populist madness clawing at it from within. A disciplined rival challenging it from without. Is liberal democracy caught helpless? smashed between the hammer of Trump and the anvil of C, or will it emerge, reforged, renewed, and resilient? Politics, the ambition of individuals and nations alike, are hard enough to navigate. But right now, our biggest threats are from forces we cannot bully or cajole, biology and physics, pandemics and global warming cannot be addressed without concerted global cooperation and specifically without a commitment to action by both the United States and China. And yet the two superpowers seem politically more apart than they have been since the Cold War. After China joined the WTO in 2001, it's become more and more integrated into the global economy. And as a consequence, the world has never seen so many people rise so quickly out of poverty. The rest of the world assumed that rising prosperity and private ownership of property at enterprises would inevitably result in greater liberalization. Instead, we've seen China under President Xi become richer, the world's second largest economy, more innovative, leading in patent lodgments and with at least four of the top 10 internet companies but at the same time more authoritarian, controlled and intolerant of dissent 
as we've seen brutally demonstrated in Hong Kong and in Xinjiang. The business culture is enterprising and in many sectors fiercely competitive. The disruptive digital economies of the internet and social media, far from producing a disruptive color revolution, have instead been harnessed by the Communist Party to consolidate its control. 30 years ago, provincial leaders would boast to me about how they could ignore directives from Beijing, saying Shan Gao Huang Di Yuan, the mountain is high and the emperor is far away. Well, today the emperor is closer than ever in what has become more or less a surveillance state. Despite recently condemning the use of trade and economic sanctions for political ends, China has proceeded to do precisely that to at least 11 countries since 2008 for offences ranging from receiving the Dalai Lama, France and the UK, awarding writer Liu Xiaobo a Nobel Prize, Norway, and most recently Australia for daring to suggest that there should be an independent inquiry into the origins of the COVID-19 virus. This more aggressive approach to foreign relations is bound up with the new wolf warrior diplomacy. Colourful tweets aside, it probably had its high point in weird recently when the Chinese embassy in Canberra released to the media a list of 14 demands with which Australia would need to comply in order to restore amicable relations. These range from compelling our media to stop criticising China, to lifting the ban on Huawei and our 5G network, to repealing my government's foreign interference and foreign influence legislation. It's worth reflecting for a moment on how Australia-China relations got to today's low ebb. The China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, the CHAFTA, had been signed in 2014 by my predecessor, Mr Abbott, and it was ratified not long after I became Prime Minister in 2015. That was probably the high point. During 2016 and 17, relations were cordial enough. Our observations on the need for all parties to comply with international law in the South China Sea were not appreciated, and my decision not to sign up to the Belt and Road Initiative was disappointing. But by the end of 2017, the extent of China's espionage and influence operations in Australia were becoming of increasing concern. And I took the opportunity to update our legislation to ensure that foreign governments and political parties could not exert corrupt, covert or coercive influence in Australia. This prompted a furious reaction from Beijing. On cue, leading figures in the Australian business community, including several of our university vice chancellors, immediately admonished me and my government for being insufficiently respectful to China. Of course, nobody wants to have a row with China or any other nation, but far too many Australians were not particularly fussed about how high a price we paid to avoid one. There were some minor trade sanctions imposed and a freeze on ministerial visits. These were part of a pressure campaign designed to ensure the new legislation did not get through the Senate, in which the government did not have a majority. However, once the legislation was passed in June 2018, calm was restored, and I sensed the relationship was returning to normal. In August 2018, we announced our decision to ban Huawei and ZTE from our 5G rollout. We were the first country to do so. 5G has a different, more distributed, virtualized and vulnerable network architecture than 4G. Over 18 months, we tried to find a technical fix, but concluded the risk could not be mitigated. I was deposed as prime minister a few days after the announcement of the Huawei decision and the coup distracted public attention in Australia. But Beijing protested mightily, claimed wrongly that we'd acted at the direction of the US and then proceeded to show its displeasure. My successor, Scott Morrison, has been PM for nearly three years, but he's not yet met with President Xi or Premier Li other than in a brief corridor encounter at the G20. Other ministerial encounters also ceased. 
Now, that's been a big change. During my time, I had several substantive meetings with President Xi, two of which were long, frank, one-on-one -on -one discussions. Premier Li had become a familiar interlocutor, and he and his wife had dined privately with us at our home in Sydney. The latest round of sanctions followed a call by Prime Minister Morrison last April for there to be an independent inquiry into the origins of the COVID virus. Hardly a remarkable request. It was met with fury from Beijing and the imposition of trade sanctions on inter alia, barley, wine, coal, lobsters, beef, together with a torrent of condemnation. Education is Australia's third largest export. In December 29, students from China accounted for nearly a third of the 750,000 foreign students in Australia. The pandemic, obviously, has dramatically reduced the inflow of foreign students, but there's every indication Beijing will discourage Chinese students and no doubt tourists from coming to Australia. The only major export which has not been impacted so far is iron ore. China's alternative supplier, Brazil, has seen reductions in production because of floods and the pandemic. As a consequence, iron ore has hit record highs. Thanks to that price spike, the value of our exports to China overall has never been higher. Most of the Australian exporters impacted by the sanctions have found alternative markets. And I hope you've all been doing your bit by drinking lots of Australian wine. Public sentiment and trust in China has crashed including among our business community. If diplomacy's objective is to win friends and influence people, the effort of the last few years have been utterly counterproductive. Now, China's original objective was to make an example of Australia, leverage business support for the China relationship to pressure the government into a more compliant posture and ideally create a split between Australia and its friends and allies quite the reverse has occurred. At the 2017 East Asia Summit in Manila, Prime Ministers Modi and Abe, President Trump and I, had agreed to revive the quadrilateral, quadrilateral dialogue between India, Japan, Australia, and the USA. Senior officials met at the conference, and we've since seen regular dialogues, including the first ever leader-level summit of the Quad, held online in March this year. China's more aggressive foreign policy also represents a big missed opportunity. Donald Trump was erratic and inconsistent with both friend and foe alike. Long-standing alliances were stressed. America's standing in the world plummeted. America first was looking more and more like America alone. During those Trump years, President Xi could have chosen to be as unlike Trump as possible consistent where Trump was erratic, measured where Trump was belligerent, but he did not so choose. It may be that public opinion in China wouldn't have stood for it. But we find ourselves today where China and the United States seem further apart than they've been for many years. Trump's furious rhetoric has been replaced by Biden's quiet deliberation, but the tariffs and trade sanctions Trump put in place are still there. And both Washington and Beijing seem set on achieving or maintaining global leadership in key technologies and industries with a view to decoupling one from the other as they do. So what is to be done? Speaking from an Australian perspective, I can say that our goal is not to constrain or slow China's rise, but rather to ensure that it does not diminish the sovereignty and autonomy of the nations in our region or undermine the rule of law. We do not want a world, to paraphrase Lee Kuan Yew, where the big fish eat the little fish and the little fish the shrimps. Or as the Athenian ambassadors said to the Melians, where the strong do as they will and the weak suffer as they must. Now it's easy to recommend foreign policy changes to Beijing and consistent with President Xi's speech a week or so ago, I would do so constructively and without sanctimony. A good start would be to abandon the economic coercion of Australia. It hasn't worked, and it's done China more harm than its intended target. 
But a bigger issue is the brittle sensitivity which brings furious and indignant reactions to foreign criticism of China's policies. Scott Morrison's call for an inquiry into the origins of the virus is a good example. If it had been ignored or met with a one-line response, China will support in due course a review by the World Health Organization, it would have sunk without trace. A furious response made it a big front page issue, and it was followed by the World Health Organization unanimously supporting an inquiry not materially different from what Morrison had proposed. But what about the West more generally? Realistically, we have to recognize that we're now in an era of very diminished trust. The key, therefore, is to identify the boundaries of trust within which we're prepared to work. Just as good fences make good neighbors, so clearly defining the boundaries of trust in economic relationships make for good business. Now, prior to 2016, the Australian government had not identified what it regarded as critical infrastructure. By August in that year, I became aware that China's state grid and another Chinese company were on the point of acquiring control of Ausgrid from the government of New South Wales. Ausgrid's the largest energy network on Australia's east coast. I also learned there were some national security issues relating to the sale that, due to a failure in our system, had not been flagged to our treasurer, who had ultimate responsibility for approving the transaction. So we blocked the sale. I later apologised to President C for our not having identified Osgrid as out of bounds at the outset, and long before the Chinese companies had spent many months and millions of dollars on due diligence. We established a critical infrastructure centre, and now investors from China or anywhere else can readily establish where opportunities are available or not. Let me say a little about decoupling and technology. When I first raised my concerns about 5G with the US administration, especially after Trump became president, I was struck by how unaware Washington was that the United States had lost leadership in wireless technology. How on earth, I argued, could it be that a US telco, say AT&T or Verizon, seeking to move to 5G, had essentially four vendors from which to choose, Huawei and ZTE from China, and Ericsson and Nokia from Sweden and Finland, respectively. How could there not be a vendor from America, let alone from Japan, Germany, or the UK? The answer, of course, is, excuse the pun, that Washington had been asleep at the switch when a combination of foreign acquisitions and relentless price competition from Chinese vendors had gutted the US wireless technology sector. So Biden is absolutely right in saying America should lead in all the key technology sectors, clean tech, AI, wireless, space, biotech, and so on. DARPA apart, dirigisme and industry policy have never been fashionable or especially well executed in the Anglosphere but it cannot be avoided unless we want to be entirely dependent on China in key areas of technology. And therein lies the subtlety. Our objective in the West should not be to constrain China's growth or technical advancement, let alone seek to undermine it. This is not a zero sum game, but we cannot in breezy insouciance allow China to make itself independent of foreign technology, which is C's stated policy, and at the same time, allow ourselves to become or remain dependent on theirs. Now, I mentioned earlier that in 2017, I declined to sign up to the Belt and Road Initiative, simply because I regarded the BRI as a slogan, the content of which was entirely written and produced in Beijing. I explained to Premier Li that we were more than happy to co-venture infrastructure projects in our region with China, as long as they met our standards of our value, value for money, governance, and so forth, that they could brand their half of it BRI, and we'd stick a large kangaroo on our half. But it was their brand, not ours. However, there's no doubt that the BRI is a policy-directed lending 
and investing strategy designed to advance China's interests, commercial and political. Where that type of investment raises national security concerns, it's not enough to discourage it. A real alternative must be offered. Now, a good example of this approach was in 2018, when my government committed to fund with $136 million in foreign aid, the Coral Sea Cable fiber optic network between Australia, the Solomon Islands, and Papua New Guinea. This preempted plans by Huawei to build a network with Chinese investment. The trilateral infrastructure partnership between the US, Japan, and Australia was established later that year, and it's already committed to fund a cable project for Palau modeled on the Coral Cable. President Biden's Build Back Better World initiative announced at the G7 in June has similar potential. Now, the pragmatic approach I'm describing recognizes, as Lee Sien Lung recently observed, that we are not likely to change China nor China us. We should never turn a blind eye to human rights abuses in China, but we should not imagine our protests are likely to force a change in policy. It is also vitally important to ensure that tensions with China do not arouse hostility to or suspicions about or anxiety among Chinese people, especially in our multicultural Western, Western societies. One and a half million Australians are of Chinese heritage, including two of our four grandchildren. The Communist Party portrays criticism of China as anti-Chinese. That conceit must be emphatically and repeatedly object, rejected. You could not imagine mo modern Australia without the contribution of the one and a half million Australians of Chinese heritage. And they're part of our Australian family. We can't allow the Communist Party in China to try to split them or divide them or disturb their confidence in their membership of this great multicultural society. Now, nonetheless, freed from the delusion that our systems of government or political values are converging, we can deal with each other within boundaries of trust that hedge risk but do not prevent cooperation, trade and investment in the wide range of less strategic sectors. So, if China is the rival without, what of the enemies within? The January 6 insurgents were convinced that Donald Trump had won the election. And Joe Biden had stolen it. Trump had told them so, as had the so-called conservative media, prominent, prominent among which is Fox News, owned by Rupert Murdoch. Stop the steal is one of the most audacious and consequential lies ever told in American politics. Today, 70% of Republican voters in the United States believe that lie. The 60 or more court decisions rejecting claims of electoral fraud are apparently of no account. To give it a uh, Chinese Communist Party gloss, you could say that the Republican Party is now thoroughly committed to the two denials, deny Biden won the election and deny the reality of global warming. In 2016, Vladimir Putin's disinformation campaign was designed to exacerbate divisions in America and in Europe, and above all, undermine confidence in democratic institutions. Steve Bannon's technical term for this approach is, and I quote him, to flood the zone with shit, which means to spread so many lies, conspiracy theories, and wild claims that people cannot discern the difference between fact and fiction. It's commonplace to blame this state of affairs on social media, and there is some truth in that. Before the internet, news and information were conveyed on curated platforms, newspapers, radio, television, that by and large sought to secure a wide audience in order to support their revenue from advertising. Over the last 25 years, digital technology has not only allowed people to publish their own content without seeking the consent of an editor, but it's also allowed publishers to profitably narrow cast to smaller audiences, which would have been unattainable or uncommercial hitherto. If this simply meant we were all free to choose our own opinions, 
then perhaps political discourse would be richer for the diversity. But now the hyper-partisanship of social media has infected so much of what we used to call mainstream media. Fear, resentment and hatred have always been the most powerful motivators in public opinion. However, we know how those political stories end. And we're seeing more and more examples of right-wing media working with right-wing populist politics in a symbiotic political ecosystem. Fox News and the Republican Party being the best known example. A few years ago, many of us would have shrugged, evoked Voltaire and re reassured ourselves that truth will prevail in the marketplace of ideas. But in fact, we are drowning in lies. Another less comforting consolation has been that once elected, <clears throat> populists will get found out because they cannot competently deliver the economic management and services expected of government. But as we've seen in the past, and as we're seeing today in Hungary and Poland, a populist authoritarian party can use the democratic system to get elected and then make changes to the institutions of democracy so that their re-election is more assured. One way of staying in power is to gerrymander districts so that they favor your party. And another is to discourage people less likely to support you from voting at all. Recently, the United States Supreme Court has upheld state legislation designed to restrict access to voting in a manner that will disadvantage voters of color. Voter suppression has a long and shameful history in the United States. Indeed, the moment of triumph in that racist 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, is when the Ku Klux Klan, led by the film's hero, rides up to intimidate the freed slaves from exercising their right to vote. Woodrow Wilson was president at the time, and it was the first movie ever screened at the White House. The normalization of voter suppression in the United States is in its own way even more confronting than the normalization of lies and conspiracy theories. For all our faults in Australia, we regard it as fundamental that every person of voting age should be on the roll and vote. In fact, we fine you a hundred bucks if you don't. In addition to that, electoral boundaries have always been set by officials as opposed to politicians. And since 1973 by an independent electoral commission. The China challenge is real enough, but a far greater threat to American and by extension Western democracy is anti-democratic populist media and politics. How do we combat it? Lies must be called out. Censorship is not the answer, but those who advertise on platforms that spread lies should be held to account for subsidizing the poison that is doing so much harm to our polity. Electoral systems must be inclusive. Everyone of adult age should be encouraged to vote. Electoral boundaries should be set fairly and independently. Populists typically channel dissatisfaction with economic change, lost jobs, lower wages, shuttered industries, and channel them into resentment of the other. The price of inequality is not just paid by those left by, by behind, but by the damage to the democracy on which all our freedoms depend. So the first task is to ensure that as old industries and jobs are lost, new ones are created. This is easier in the dynamic environment of big cities than in single industry towns, but it requires forward planning and, in, and inevitably government leadership. The invisible hand is not enough. The solution to the Rust Belt is to ensure it does not exist. This will require imagination and determination, but must be done. Communities which feel they've been left behind by technology, globalization, indeed modernity, have to be protected and know they are. So when a leader speaks about renewable energy, he or she should focus on the thousands of new jobs it creates rather than just deliver a lecture on atmospheric physics. Biden gets that. It's no comfort to be woke if you are broke. In our time, the most potent rallying cause of populists 
from Trump to Le Pen to Orban, has been fear of immigrants, especially those who are of a different race or religion. Nothing is more corrosive of multicultural societies than racism and religious prejudice. So it's essential in my view that the people must know that they, through their government, are always in control of who enters their country. That's why we've maintained a very strict policy of border protection in Australia. We have a very generous official refugee program, but do all we can to prevent unauthorised arrivals. This has maintained confidence in our very successful multicultural society, where nearly a third of all Australians were born overseas and more than half have at least one parent born overseas. So liberal democracies are challenged by China, but with constant solidarity, consistent solidarity, the relationship can be managed within boundaries of trust. If the democracies, especially in the, in the Indo-Pacific, support each other in maintaining their sovereignty, if the rule of law is respected, and if economic coercion is abandoned, then collaboration can coexist with competition. The internal threats to liberal democracy are momentous. A bitterly divided nation may survive, but it can hardly thrive, nor can it provide an inspiring example of freedom to others. We have to expose the normalization of lies and hold those responsible who enable it. Governments must be accountable through fair electoral systems an independent judiciary and law enforcement. And right at the heart of this mission, our mission, is honesty and trust, two much neglected political virtues, which the Ditchley Foundation was founded by Sir David Wills to promote. Thank you very much.